Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 24 of Ben Franklin's World a podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. What can you tell about a person from the clothes they wear? It turns out you can tell quite a lot. Today we speak with Kimberly Alexander, a museum professional and an expert in 18th century fashion and textiles. During our conversation, Kimberly reveals what historians mean when they use the term material culture, how we can read clothing and objects such as teapots and pewter tankards as historical sources, and what the clothing worn by 18th century men and women can tell us about them. To answer this specific question, Kimberly takes us through her examinations of the 1730s wedding dress worn by Elizabeth Bull and the suit John Hancock likely wore to his inauguration as Massachusetts governor in 1780. But before we get to our fascinating conversation, it's time for our new segment, Ask an Historian. You pose the question, and now Liz has the answer. It's time for Ask the Historian. Today we begin our new occasional segment, Ask an Historian, with an excellent question that I received from Rick, who emailed me to ask, how can a history lover determine whether or not a history book they pick up to read will be historically accurate? This is a fantastic question, Rick, and I'm happy to answer it for you by telling you how I determine whether or not I want to read a history book and how skeptical I should be when I read that history book. When I pick up a potential history book, I like to know three things. Who wrote the book? Who published the book? And what do the notes in the book look like? I like to know who wrote the book because that is a first indicator to me of how skeptical I should be when I read the book. If the book was written by a professional historian, someone who teaches history at a university, someone who works at a a historic site or a museum, or an independent scholar like myself with an extensive background in professional historic work, that's an indicator to me that the person knows what they're talking about, they're a professional, and they likely did the best job that they could. So that tells me that the information in the book should be fairly historically accurate. Now, if the book was written by someone who is a journalist turned historian, that makes me a little bit more skeptical of the book. Journalists turned historians tend to write fantastic stories, and the information that they put in that story may be accurate but it may only be partial information. In my experience with these books, journalists turned historians tend to emphasize the very dramatic events of the past and leave out less dramatic but very important events from the past. So that doesn't mean that I won't read their book, but I know that I should be a bit more skeptical of the book. I also like to know whether the person just has a deep interest in the period. Oftentimes you'll see someone who identifies as an independent scholar. Um, They're not necessarily a professional historian, but they're someone who has a deep interest in the past and spent the last 40 years researching a subject. That tells me that the book should be fairly accurate because they have spent so long researching that project. Now, again, in my experience, Those types of books tend to be less well-written than those by the journalist-turned-historians or by the professional historians. So what I'll do at that point, if that's the case, is, well, I'll do this with any of these books. I turn to the introduction or to the first chapter, and I'll read the first couple pages. And that'll give me an idea of how the person writes and whether or not I might enjoy continuing to read this book. If not, if it's just too hard for me to get through, I just put the book down and move on. Now, who published the book? This is important to me because if it's a book written by uh, published by an academic press, that's an indicator that the book should be fairly accurate because 
books printed by academic presses should have gone through a peer review process. This means that other historians had a chance to read the book and challenge the information in it and request changes from the author. So the process of peer review should yield a fairly accurate book. If the book is printed by a popular publishing house, i.e. Random House, Simon & Schuster, Macmillan, The book is likely to be a fun, well-written read um, because those are the types of books those presses produce. But that doesn't mean that the information in the book will be accurate. It'll have a nice flashy cover because they want to sell those books, but it doesn't mean that they'll be accurate. So that's where knowing the background of the author um, can help you determine the accuracy of the book. Why do I like to know what the notes look like? We all know I'm a big history geek. I will flip to the back of the book, which is where the notes um, tend to be these days. And I'm not looking for the quantity of the notes. The quantity is not going to tell me anything about the accuracy. What I do is I skim the notes to see what is being cited. Are they primary sources? And those are sources that you would find in manuscript collections. Are they letters, government records, um, other diaries, other such documents? Are they oral histories? Um, Are they special collections with objects and material culture like we'll talk about with Kimberly Alexander in just a few moments? If the sources cited are mostly those kind of primary sources, then you know that the author really put the time into researching their book. If what you're seeing in those notes are mostly books written by other people, that's an indicator that the author probably didn't put enough time into researching their book. Um, So that's something to be skeptical of. Oh, and one other thing you could check, Rick, you could flip to the acknowledgments section and see who they're citing and and thanking for helping them with their book. I don't know of an historian that writes a book and does not owe a debt of thanks to the librarians and archivists um, and institutions that help give them research funding um, without citing them in the acknowledgments. Um, If they receive that kind of funding, if they received assistance at these institutions, you'll be able to read where they went and researched right in the acknowledgement section. Um, So you'll want to check that out. Um, So use the acknowledgement section and the notes as an indicator of what kind of sources were used in the book. Now, Rick, I hope that answers your question. I, of course, cannot guarantee you that every book you'll read will be historically accurate, but if you use my three-step process, you should get an idea of which books you, you can trust more than others. Now, if you have a question about early American history or about the historical profession, I hope you'll send it to me via tweet at Liz Covart through email like Rick to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Leave me a comment in Poor Richard's Club or visit BenFranklinsWorld.com where on the right side of the page, you can click on the Ask an Historian button and leave me your question via voicemail. Okay, well, Rick, thanks again for your question. And now I think it's time that I introduce you to Kimberly Alexander. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Kimberly S. Alexander teaches courses in museum studies and material culture at the University of New Hampshire. She earned her Ph.D. in art and architectural history from Boston University. As a museum professional, Kimberly was founding curator of architecture and design at the MIT Museum. She went on to serve as curator of architecture and design at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, and was the chief curator of the Strawberry Bank Museum in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Her current book and exhibition project is titled Cosmopolitan Consumption, Georgian Shoe Stories from the Long 18th Century. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Kimberly. Thank you so much for having me, Liz. We are really excited to have you with us today because you research a different kind of history from most historians. You work on early American fashion and material culture. So I wonder, you know, as we get started here, if you could tell us a bit about yourself and how you became interested in this aspect of early American history. Well, sure. Um, it's, it's sort of an interesting story, I suppose. The, the portal through which I was introduced to material culture was, in fact, through architecture. Uh, My father, Jim Alexander, is a prominent Boston preservation architect, and so I grew up viewing the world through a particular lens and a particular way of seeing and experiencing the built environment. Architecture and history, materials and function, structure and use, I grew up seeing that these are all interconnected. And over time, 
um, these skills became quite transferable to the study of not only architecture, but also art and material culture. Um, a scholarship to study with Sotheby's in London gave me a chance to go behind the scenes of London auction houses to do intensive textile study sessions with Victoria and Albert. And well, after that, the deal was pretty much sealed. <laughs> so... Before we get too far in here, material culture really seems like a buzzword that museums and historians like to throw around to sound sophisticated. Would you tell us what that term means and how you define it? Well, I, I have a few thoughts about the, the way the term is currently being used. I think, for one thing, it's perhaps being expanded, much the way folks today discuss curating their Pinterest board, whereas my thoughts about curating are a bit different than that, or the way the term architecture and platform have been appropriated by other fields. But from my perspective, um, the theory and methodology of material culture is, is simply stated the study of history through an analysis of buildings, uh, human created landscapes, and artifacts made and used, in my case, in the United States. For my students, I, I like to emphasize readings that reflect stress, uh, fresh strategies uh, in in the field and in new directions um, and best practices. And by that, I mean, how are those who are actively involved with both uncovering, recovering um, aspects of material culture, whether it's archaeology, whether it's building fabric, whether it's textile history, um, any number of different uh, uh, subject matters, and how you place those and interpret them with or within, with or outside a contextual setting. So material culture could really be almost anything that's man-made. So it could be textiles, it could be a teapot or a pewter tankard. Yes, exactly. And a number, a number of us in the field uh, work with all of these different media. Um, the time that I uh, spent at Strawberry Bank as a, a chief curator there, I worked with everything from archaeology and, and uh, helping with archaeological digs to overseeing building preservation to working with uh, very uh, early, early documents um, from local merchant families to, again, textiles and, and, and garments. Um, it, it very, very rich potential there, uh, I have to say. So I know your expertise is in textiles, so let's dive in. You have a blog called Silk Damask, and you post a lot of pictures and information about fashion in the 18th century on it. Would you tell us about what types of clothing and accessories people who lived in British North America would have worn? Sure. Well, actually, that could be a whole discussion, just uh, a whole interview in and of itself. I'm always amazed by the sheer number of items, um, of, of, uh, of fashion items, of textiles, of accessories, which are available in a city like Boston already by the mid-18th century and really before. One of my favorite uh, tales is of a Boston shopkeeper named Henrietta Maria East Kane, who actually had a rather unfortunate series of events take place in her life that allowed us, though, as uh, costume and textile historians to to reap the benefit of a four-page, full-page discussion of auction contents from her shop. And it's pretty staggering when you see what she had available for the Boston consumer. Um, so as I said, it was about four full pages. And because she had to have everything put up at auction, it was well-documented by the, uh, the auction house. She had bundles of what were called baby's rollers, uh, R-O-W-L-E-R-S. Those were like little pudding hats put on babies' heads to protect them when they were learning to walk. They had women's tabby stays, scarlet calamanco, every imaginable silk, and even the odd wig was up for sale. Uh, poor Henrietta, even some of her own household items were for sale as well. But in this four pages, you have, first of all, you need to understand what a lot of the language is. It's, it's, uh, for many of us today, it would be considered quite full of jargon. Um, you know, what is a tabby stay? Um, what is uh, a tammy? What is a calamanco? Um, what are silk clocks? Uh, what are, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. And so just uh, get, having a chance to review this sort of material and figure out what type of textile, what type of fabric, uh, where it was coming from. There are goods coming from all over the world. 
to Boston's port as well as to Newburyport and Salem and, and Portsmouth and, and, and Kittery, uh, Maine, um, uh, accessible for a price, of course. So dare I ask what a tabby stay is? <laughs> yes, you may. A stay actually would be a, a, a corded version of, of what we think of as a corset. Um, and uh, uh, part of the foundation and undergarments, again, just uh, understanding what went underneath the, the clothing uh, is, is sort of a, a, an art in and of itself. And there are a number of, uh, of really brilliant scholars who talk about how you actually dress the 18th century man and how you dress the 18th century woman. But you would have started with um, uh, a garment known as a, uh, today as a man for a linen shirt, which became sort of the, the universal garb that you started your whole day with. And then you would put on subsequent breeches and vests and socks. Uh, this varies a lot depending on your socioeconomic status, I should say, however, uh, how many types of garments you had, what types of garments you had, um, and so on and so on. For a woman, a tabby stay would have been of a, a cotton tabby cloth and would probably have been embroidered. Um, uh, and then possibly corded so that it would offer um, coverage over over a, a linen or cotton chemise in order to create a silhouette that was desirable at that time. In the 1750s, it would have been one that would have reached from a very narrow waist down into a point just below the navel. None of this clothing sounds really comfortable. <laughs> No, and nor does it to me, but my my colleagues who are reenactors will swear by the value of a, a well-fitted and well-laced, not overlaced, but a well-laced corset as something that will uh, improve your posture um, and help with back problems and any number of other things. So it's it's something that the great corset and uh, debate uh which of course the corsets and stays um is one that still rages today on on uh, twitter and the internet and in books and so on <laughs> so let's look at a suit of clothes in particular you have examined and worked with elizabeth bull's wedding dress which dates between about 1731 and 1735 and is owned by the bostonian society would you tell us who elizabeth bull was what her dress looks like and what you can tell about bull's past and the early american past by looking at her wedding dress this is one of those just wonderful stories and and i i i feel honored and privileged to have worked with uh, the staff at the Boston Society on this garment for the last year and a half or so. And I, I do want to uh, let uh, your listeners know that sometime probably late spring or early summer of 2015, the Elizabeth Bowl gown will be going back on view for the first time in, in decades, having been conserved and had a special uh, case built for it that will monitor light conditions. Um, it's an amazing opportunity. And that'll be at the Old State House in Boston? Yes, it will. Um, it will be at the Old State House. And on, on view, they'll be rotating out parts of the gown. So there should always be something um, related to the gown, either the petticoat or the, the dress itself um, or the practice bodice on view for visitors. And I, I guess I can't stress enough um, how important this garment is, particularly for those of us in, in New England, to have the survival of a textile from, that was started about 1731 and, and uh, completed in 1735, but then which had many alterations uh, after after that time period. But to, to start with the early date and to actually have the name of the wearer and the creator associated with this garment is phenomenal. Elizabeth Bull herself, and this is, I think, answers uh, one of the questions that, that we'll be talking about later. Um, how, how do garments uh, and textiles tell us things that we might not find in the historical record? If it were not for the survival of this dress and a series of other related textiles, Elizabeth Bull might not have even made it into more of a footnote as the wife of the Reverend Roger Price. And I find that really powerful. So many of the, the women and, and the men that I come into contact through their clothing would not have made it into our traditional historical record or would have been underneath the footnote were it not for the survival of these, these tangible objects. 
things that can can put you in a place and a time in a way that maybe a written document cannot. Um, we know that Elizabeth Bull was uh, the daughter of a, a, a wealthy tavern keeper in Boston, John Bull, who also had a wharf. Um, I think it's still maybe even have the name attached to it uh, down by the waterfront. But he, he had one daughter, and that was Elizabeth. And she was able to live in a light an elite lifestyle. The dress that she started working on in 1731, she began working on when she was 15 years old. Um, The idea of needlework as uh, being connected with genteel society and genteel arts and civility was, of course, something that um, came over with uh, many of the British American colonists and would have been a continued connection with 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 Great Britain, the so young women were schooled in these arts who could afford <laughs> who could afford that. Now we don't know if Elizabeth Bull's mother worked with her on her silk embroidery, or if she had an official instructor. But you can see um, the hand on the skirt of a pattern that's being drawn for her to follow for her embroidery. There were uh, certainly in Boston in the 17 by uh, the 1720s and 30s uh, uh, women's educational institutions, not the way we think of them today, but as places where you could go and learn painting or drawing or again skilled needlework, white work, embroidery, silk embroidery, and so on. Um, so we don't know who was working with Elizabeth Ball, but she started the dress when she was 15. And she worked on it from 1731 till 1735, which is when she married Reverend Roger Price, who uh, was, I think, about a decade older than she was and was the the representative of the Anglican Church in in New England for all intents and purposes. Um, When she wore her dress for the wedding in April of uh, 1735, it was still not finished. And... uh, Trisha Gilrain, the collections manager at the Bostonian Society, who I've uh, been working with, and Nate Shidley, the historian at, at the Bostonian Society. And I've also think that by contemporary parlance, she probably had a bit of OCD, um, expressive compulsive disorder, because she was still working on this gown. It looks like the day that she got married. You can see the places that did not get finished. This is a huge project. I mean, I think of, you know, my own upbringing. I can't imagine starting a project when I was 15 and still working on it five years later. And it is a thing of incredible beauty. The silk that the gown is made from is a Chinese silk. So it's an imported Chinese silk. Um, You can't see it today except in certain light, but it was this very pale celadon green. So there's a silk underlayment and then multicolor silk threads. And the dress looks like a garden. Um, sprouted all over the petticoat and down the back. There are roses and peonies and carnations and uh, and all sorts of vines. And it's just, it is truly, truly a beautiful piece. Um, It was saved and obviously treasured by the family. Some of the family lore suggests that it was worn by um, uh, Elizabeth's daughter, when uh, they went back later, they went they went back to England in 1754 after being in Boston, um, and never she never Elizabeth Bull and her husband never returned, but that her daughter may have worn it um, to court in a later date. It was then altered again, probably by other family members in the 1830s, and perhaps even again in the 1860s. There's actually a photograph which survives of a live model, a woman modeling the dress in the early years of the 20th century. Wow. So, yeah, so it's had a a lot of changes, but you can still see Elizabeth's hand. And I think that's the other thing that a garment like this does, is it, it, the garment combined with some other pieces of, of, uh, of clothing that she embroidered for her, her newborn, her newborn children, um, and young toddlers, uh, the memories of the family, they donated the material, the uh, the Price family donated these artifacts to the Boston Society in 1910. 
So just to give a sense of the, the continuity. But when you piece together the fact that she not only was responsible for her own gown, but also for making the clothes for her children, you start to see certain skills that that she had. And she was known in the family for um, for her incredible needle skills. So what else does this mean? It, it, it also shows we know where she lived. She lived in um, a house over at what we would call today the end of sort of over by the ladder streets. We know um, where she walked. You know, her husband was, uh, they were married at, at the old Trinity Church right near the Bostonian Society on um, Washington Street in Boston. She would have walked by what would have been the brand new state house. Now we know it is the old state house in Boston, um, had been just completed in 1713. She would have known um, uh, a number of buildings that we associate with Boston now, and she these would have been part of her familiar walk. For all I know, she may have bought uh, things at Henrietta Kane's shop, the one that just mentioned earlier. So you're able to create a different type of world looking at Elizabeth Bull. As the, the wife of Reverend Roger Price, she would have been somebody who had the ability to sway fashion. What she wore would have been uh, something that others would have emulated as the style um, of the time. She would have spent time visiting. She would have spent time uh, entertaining and so on and so on. So so through this one garment, um, we have a chance to uh, begin to bring aspects of Boston history out of, you know, somewhat out of the shadows and see it a little bit from her perspective. One of the fascinating things that this also has led me to is looking after what happened after uh, the Price family moved to uh, back to, to, to Britain. And um, thanks to the uh, National Archives in, uh, of the UK, I was able to cut, find her will as well as her husband's which add an, an, another fascinating perspective to the way their marriage worked. She had wealth, he had title, and that becomes pretty clear when you start to read the will and how they left their possessions and their financial situations. So I have more questions about how you look at clothing, but before we move on, you mentioned that Elizabeth embroidered her dress. You know, mm-hmm. embroidery Elite women would learn to bro- embroider, or at least it's my understanding, that they learned to embroider um, as a show of wealth. Like they had the leisure time to be able to sit there and do something exactly. delicate and refined. But I also wonder if if her husband predeceased her and she was widowed and, you know, like many women may not have actually had a lot of money at the time of her, her being widowed. Could she have used the embroidery skills she picked up on this dress to earn a living? Um, if she had to. Now, as I said, she was the one with wealth, so in her case, it did not apply. In fact, when her husband uh, died, he actually said, because of my wife's, um, I forget how it was phrased, but basically he did not need to leave her any any money to support herself when he died because she was still so well off, even after all that time, all those decades out of being away from Boston. But, but what would a woman do? And we do see examples of this, of women who then fall on hard, hard times. And, and then they will teach embroidery. You'll find that many of the women who open schools throughout New England are doing that as either independent women or because they need to supplement an income after um, a husband has died. So you could take in uh, pupils if your skills were very good. Uh, many women did that. Or you could do other things. But again, it's, it's, it, we don't have a lot of paper trail on, on how many might become um, something like a seamstress or a dressmaker, because that was a, a different type of skill as opposed to uh, needlework and embroidery and even white work, things like that. So you read these, this needlework And fashion accessories and fashion in general, like many historians read old letters, government records, journals, and other printed documents. How do you read or analyze a piece of clothing or a fashion accessory? And I know you've looked at the John Hancock suit of clothes, also owned by the Bostonian Society. So would you use that as an example and tell us how you go about reading Hancock's suit as a historical source? 
Yes, I, I will say right up front that this is still a work in, in progress. Um, I've had the chance to look at uh, John Hancock's, uh, this is his red crimson suit. I should mention this is also on view at the Bostonian Society. Um, this, when we first talked about uh, this interview, I felt that since we're uh, chatting about this, it would be good to point to artifacts and objects that people could actually go and see. So John Hancock's uh, suit of clothes is, is also on view. It is on view right now at the Boston Society. Um, but so this is a work in progress. I've, I've examined uh, the suit, not fully at this time, the jacket, the red crimson jacket that, that uh, people are quite familiar with from, uh, it may well have been um, the jacket that uh, Hancock wore to his uh, gubernatorial um, inauguration. Other, others have posited that, that Hancock was quite a dandy, quite a peacock, and they'll point to this crimson coat and the, his uh, metallic embroidered blue silk vest and his, you know, the bright yellow uh, uh, chariot or carriage, which he had. But I, I guess part of what I'm looking at is there's another story that, um, that the Hancock family textiles Start to tell, and they're also in addition to the objects um, I'm working with, the artifacts at the Boston site. There's some wonderful pieces um, that I'm also working with at the Massachusetts Historical Society. So, so there are a number of different stories sort of percolating. But with the jacket, one thing that becomes apparent is that it was was altered. And I think whether it's a, a modern day concept, um, you know, sort of our throwaway culture, but even those who are wealthy. Uh, and had um, access to high-end goods and materials would often um, restyle their clothes for contemporary taste. So Hancock's suit um, probably was made in London and um, probably altered uh, in Boston. There's the name of a, a tale that's somewhat associated with, with Hancock. But he, like other of that time period, I mean, you could look at George Washington's clothing up until the time of really the, his second inauguration when Washington has his suit made, in, I believe, in Hartford of, a, of, of brown wool, all locally manufactured. But up until that point, you can look at, at the records of George Washington um, ordering his clothes from London. Um, and actually being very, very particular about what they looked like and what the materials were. His wedding suit of clothing was certainly no less ornate than anything that uh, Hancock ever wore. His clothing was uh, definitely um, altered to be updated with the times. So he had a suit, a red velvet or crimson suit, and it had very full what we call a skirt or tails when it was originally constructed. Looks like it was then modified to be a slimmer fit as you move into uh, what we call the, the sort of neoclassical period. So he's altering his, having his clothes altered, remade. And that sort of begs a different sort of question then. So he didn't throw it out. He didn't give it away. He had it remade. So I think that's something that I see over and over again is that people actually, even of an elite status, would remake their existing textiles because textiles were so expensive and so valuable. Um, the other thing about Hancock's uh, uh, clothing, um, as I've been going through receipts and records of, of his purchases, is he bought clothing equally um, from uh, London, uh, but he bought just as much from um, from, from Boston uh, tailors, shoemakers, and even those who were making things like his uh, buckles for his breeches or his shoes. He had some examples from London, um, actually, which are currently on view uh, in in. Portsmouth at uh, Cosmopolitan Consumption, a, a exhibit that I've co-curated. Um, but he also had uh, some buckles that were made by uh, Boston craftsmen, which are on view at the Massachusetts Historical Society. So it, it's it's much more complicated, I think, than than we've been given to understand. 
So you look at fabrics, you'll, you'll take Hancock suit and you're going to look at what fabric it is. Were there any alterations made? Right. Um, try to determine where the clothing came from, who made it, and then maybe what type of value the wearer placed on this clothing. It sounds right. like, you, you know, you can then use the information you find to go into the printed record and maybe unlock the stories of the tailor who altered it or the uh, right. tailor who made exactly. the suit. And, and these are not necessarily people who would have always left left a written record, but yet you can still somehow unlock their story. This is exactly, exactly true. Um, and in fact, with, with Hancock um, already, you, uh, been able to start to put together a group of, of, of Boston um, uh, artisans who were responsible for aspects of his clothing and dress. Um, I mean, one of the best known examples, of course, is, is uh, in the recently published book about uh, Robert 12 Hughes and uh, the Tea Party as a shoemaker. And he remembers as a young man going to and delivering the repaired shoe to John Hancock's uh, home. Um, but there are many, many examples of this. I mean, the, he had uh, one of uh, he had his wig shaved and barbered by somebody, of course, right right in town. He ordered his shoes um, both from London and from from local cord liners. Um, and the same went for his wife, for Dolly. He uh, ordered uh, when they were uh, before they were married. When uh, uh, John was in Philadelphia overseeing the Second Continental Congress, he was picking out clothing for Dolly and also for his aunt, um, uh, Aunt Lydia, and sending them back to Boston with every hope that they would like and appreciate the shoes that he was sending back from Philadelphia. And those were London-made shoes. Um, And then you think, well, wow, that was 1775, and people are still buying shoes from from London, um, there are a whole lot of political things that start to crop up around clothing as well. Um, I'm sorry, I think I got off track and didn't actually answer your question, but but yes, then they go to secondary sources. So I'll look at who was the tailor, who was the cord wainer, who was the craftsperson who made this particular piece, and some of the the items um, that I'm particularly interested. I've actually been finding some very interesting receipts at the Mass Historic that I hope will be putting some pieces together in ways they haven't been in the past. So we've sort of, in a roundabout way, answered this question, but I wonder if you might provide us with a direct answer. Do material objects such as clothing, shoes, and teapots allow you to see anything about the past that paper or manuscript-based historians like myself might miss in the documents that we study? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, again, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of things you will not find um, in the written record that are revealed in, in, for example, clothing. Um, I think I already mentioned reused and remade objects. Um, When you put a pair of shoes into somebody's lifespan, for example, when were the shoes made or if you know when they were purchased and when they were altered, you can also start to see some maybe some changes in the wearers, um, the way somebody wore their shoes. This is something I'm fascinated by. There's a, a was there a, a limp? Was there an overpronation? Was there gout? Um, what what were some of the health issues that might have required the changes? There's a pair of shoes um, that I'm working with, Elizabeth Wentworth Warner's shoes in Portsmouth. And they started off as a pair of high-heeled, fashionable London shoes in the 1760s. What we have now is a pair of pretty simple slippers. The heel was cut off. They were made into uh, a, a flat shoe, um, a slipper. Uh, and when you look at from the back, you can see that the wearer had difficulty walking because one side is substantially more worn than the other. Now, she's not somebody who shows up particularly in any historical documents except for her death notice. Um, but we find out uh, in a very sort of small, small corner of the newspaper that uh, she did not attend her the reading of her husband's will because of illness. So I don't have the missing link yet, but was there something that had happened to her physically that caused her to change her her shoes um, and that may have kept her from this particular event. Now, this is just something I'm working on. It's not in any way something I'm 
have been able to prove at this point, but it sets out a series of questions. There's another great example of a pair of shoes where a gusset of a, a piece of fabric was sewn into the top of the shoe to widen it for someone's foot. Now, it, we don't know who the wearer is, but right away that tells you that there were alterations made. Was it because of illness? Was it because of uh, many, uh, ch- maybe the, the wearer had had many children? Maybe she was crippled by gout? Or maybe the shoes were given to somebody else? We never know these answers, but right away it starts to to build up some of the issues and problems that people would have had at that time period. Um, another issue that doesn't show up in the in the written record is one that I like to call intentionality, which is how you made decisions about what you wore, and the idea of the stories that shoes tell. I think is something that's very very uh, very important. For example. Um, a pair of wedding shoes uh, uh, that were worn by a bride who was lame. Um, she was married in 1764. Her name was Mary Wise, uh, and she married Nathaniel Farley. Um, the shoes are at the Ipswich Museum, and they're beautiful. Silk brocade shoes, height of fashion, out of London, um, highly desirable accessories, but she was lame. and. She had one of the shoes built up with a superstructure so that the, that she could walk with both of them at an even keel. Now, the usual, the usual way of handling this is you would have worn a pair of heavy, black, uh, very thick shoes with a built-up sole inside. She made a decision that I'm getting married today and I want to look like a bride. And so she had this superstructure built onto her shoes. I really actually never see anything quite like it. But so she's making that decision, a conscious decision about how she wants to be um, on her on her, her wedding day. And those shoes were saved and passed down. Um, and I think that's I think that's something that you would not miss it, that you won't find when you read anything about her in the standard genealogy or history. It's just that she'd married so and so and she had so many children. Now she becomes a person with a bit more of a personality. She becomes more three dimensional too. Exactly, exactly. You can you can you can actually relate to her, and I think whether it's Elizabeth Wentworth Warner or uh, or Mary Wise Farley or another example um, is uh, Deborah Saxter. So we have a wonderful pair of uh, shoes that are um, from the Mass- from the Maine Historical Society that. Um, are a lovely silk brocade, the this rich, rich woven silk textile um, from the what we would call the Rococo period, and her mother, Deborah's mother, also named Deborah, always gets confusing as we know in New England, where everyone has the same name generation after generation. But her mother was also named Deborah, and was married in 1739, and when her daughter Deborah married. She took some of the fabric from the mother's dress and had shoes made from the fabric. Now, that's a very, very interesting aspect of intentionality. You know, she didn't go with whatever was the latest stylish. She actually took elements like something, you know, something old and had her shoes made from that. But once I started looking into her genealogy, her background, I realized her mother died about three years before she got married. So was there then a sense of bringing her mother with her into her new life through this fabric, through the gown of her mother's wedding dress, literally and figuratively bringing her from her old life into her new married life? Um, that's another issue of, of making a conscious decision about how about, about what you wear. And I think those stories are really quite fascinating. Well, thank you for taking the time to answer my questions. Before we move on to the time warp, we have a couple listener questions that, if you wouldn't mind, we'd like answered. So Nyasha would like to know what role enslaved women or free African or African-American women played in 18th century fashion? Did they serve the roles as seamstresses or hairdressers or or some other role entirely? Well, yes, um, actually, enslaved women and and freed African-American women definitely played a role as seamstresses. Um, as far as enslaved women, the, the 
the value um, of, of a woman was increased if she had the skills as a seamstress. But it's a difficult, it's a very difficult um, topic to get at because whether African American or white, seamstresses tend to be very anonymous. Um, there are rare cases where somebody's name is is uh, mentioned in an account book or in someone's uh, day book or diary that brings them out of anonymity. But it's very, very hard to connect an actual seamstress with an item of costume, at least in this, in this 18th century time period. By the late 1800s, and then certainly by the early 1900s. But in this time period, the anonymity for seamstresses is, is, is it's, it's very hard to get at. And when you do find examples, you'll see them over and over again. Jason would like to know if you have ever seen any aspects of Native American culture represented in 18th century Anglo-American fashion. Well, this is um, this is a, a complicated, uh, complicated issue also, because I think there are some. I've seen examples mostly in accessories, um, and by that I mean things like slippers, shoes, hats, maybe vests. Uh, here in New England, Native American snowshoes were highly prized. Um, but I think that there are are some aspects which become much more politicized. I mean, if you think of, let's see, I, I don't remember which year, but there's a, and you may remember this list, there's a wonderful Ben Franklin portrait where he shows himself with a fur hat and a leather vest trying to look more sort of rustic than earlier when he was wearing his silks and so on. Sure. In France, when he wanted to cultivate the image of an American to get French support. Exactly. And so, so there are also are political reasons, I think, that, that people adopt or what they might consider a more rustic or, or Native American type of costuming. But there are certainly examples um, there was a wonderful, wonderful exhibit uh, uh, at the Maine State um, uh, Museum a few years ago called Uncommon Threads that looked at Abenaki and Wabanaki textiles and talked about some issues of trade with, with, with local um, uh, uh, Americans, Europeans. And in that case, again, there were things that were more often small pieces of fabric or baskets. But I think it's an area that certainly is deserving of much more, uh, much more study. And one last question. Joni would like to know how the more fragile textiles used in 18th century fashion were laundered and pressed. And she specifically referenced lace, laces, silks, and embroidered wool. This is, this is a, a really, it's, it's a very challenging, challenging question. Um, First of all, there was a limited amount of cleaning that you could do to any one of those fabrics. Um, things like laces, silks, um, the main idea was to try and keep them as clean as possible. So often there were, uh, you would you had a series of undergarments that you wore underneath um, so that you didn't have things like perspiration stains, things like that. Um, that we find a lot in 19th century clothing that is destroyed silks. But you also had movable and removable parts. Often when you look at some of these beautiful dresses in portraits or at a museum that have these lovely lace sleeves, cuffs hanging out, um, those could be taken off and new ones added that were clean and, and pressed. There's a wonderful reference even to uh, to some ruffles being made for John Hancock for one of his shirts that you could change. So um, often hems could have had uh, another, uh, a, a longer piece hanging down that, that you could then clean or remove. So there was, there was a focus on certain high use areas. Um, with silks and laces, it, the laces you could do some cleaning and pressing. Um, Silk then is now is is a, is a challenge. You do not have the chemicals to treat it, um, and there's actually a really interesting aspect of color which goes along with these silks. Some of the lighter the color of of silk, obviously, the harder it's going to be maintained. And you start to get into questions of again of whether or not somebody had to do any sort of work, because if you are wearing a white 
uh, silk vest as a man, a waistcoat, I should say, or a white brocaded gown, you're pretty much making the statement that you you don't do any lifting, you don't do any manual labor, because you know those types of materials could not be fully cleaned. You could do spot cleaning, um, and that was about it. Wool is a very very hard uh, uh, material to 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 maintain at this time period, and in fact, one of the things that that we often find with with wolves is that they haven't fared well with infestation. Um, uh, uh, moths and things like that, for example. So, so as far as actually what you could do to launder and press, it's re- you really focused on the undergarments of linen and cotton, trying to maintain the outside garment as clean as possible through w- how you wore it, how you covered it, and how you maintained it, and if you could upgrade other pieces. Even um, uh, you had jackets and things that would go over. Um, it was a whole art to you know, to what was it, what was actually exposed. The suits that we see that have survived often for men, again, whether it's John Hancock or I was just uh, writing about Samuel Cutts, um, uh, a patriot uh, out of out of New Hampshire, um, whose clothes were so uh, cut so trimly that you couldn't do a day's work in that in the garb, and that's what it was. The clothing clothing was meant to show you. So many of these cues. Um, are, are are so unfamiliar with us for us today that we need to really take a different you know a, try and a, take a different look at why they looked the way they looked. Well, thank you for answering those questions. But now we should transition into the time warp. This is a fun sure. segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently, or if someone had acted differently. <laughs> The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Are you ready for your Time Warp question, Kimberly? I am. (laughs) In your opinion, what might have happened if the 13 colonies had not gained their independence from Great Britain? How might the fashion history of the United States be different? Okay, well, first of all, I think this is a great question. Um, And I think that, that... it, much like um, the uh, much like architecture or the production of ceramics, there would have been a continued adherence to what was happening in Britain. But I think over time, changes would have started to happen, and it, it, based on um, climate and availability, um, and I think also. Experiments. I mean, there's some wonderful early experiments. If you think of Eliza Lucas Pinckney in South Carolina, where there was a group of of, uh, of uh, Salem uh, merchants who tried, for example, to get silk production going in this country. Um, uh, ben Franklin, uh, as part of his uh, printing work, had um, a, a manufacturing for flax, which was used in so many different ways. I think that there would have been changes gradually, uh, just as, as there were over time. Um, styles may well have started to change um, to be something that was, again, more fitted to climate rather than to fashion, particularly in, in New England or in the, or in the South. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. I think that, uh, though, over time, things would have changed to look like something um, more suited to, to geography than to country. Interesting. Well, before we conclude, would you tell us about what pieces of fashion or objects you are researching and writing about now? Well, right now I'm 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 pretty much about uh, about shoes. <laughs> um, I've, I'm working on a, a publication um, uh, called Fashionable Fripperies: The Colonial Shoe in Georgian America. Um, I have an exhibit uh, on on view through through June called Cosmopolitan Consumption. New England Shoe Stories, 1750 to 1850. But uh, I'm fascinated by so many things. I'm working still with the Bostonian Society and the Massachusetts Historical Society collections, also with uh, Historic Deerfield um, and a number of different institutions in Portsmouth. Uh, I, I try and look at as much as I can. Um, and 
every day is a, every day is a new day. <laughs> um, but my blog is is uh, something that I greatly enjoy, and you can find there sort of the the way that I, I'd like to think about object and how you research them and and uh, and then and, and sharing them. Um, getting comments back. I've had terrific response from families of descendants of people, some of the, the cord winners, for example, who've passed materials along to me. So it's a, every, every day is different. And I just, I love what I do. So where can the Carrie Bradshaws among us go and see your shoe exhibit? <laughs> and when, and how long is the exhibit open? The, um, the exhibit is up through June 5th of 2015. And it's at the Portsmouth Athenaeum. Um, right in Port, right in downtown Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which, uh, if you haven't been to the Athenaeum, is a great visit just in of itself because it's an 1817 building, and it it um, you can basically just imagine the reading that was done there uh, almost uh, 200 years ago and so on. Um, but it's there till the till June 5th, and we have a number of programs. If you go down to the Portsmouth Athenaeum website, you can take a look at the activities. We will be concluding the um, exhibits run with a day and a half um, symposium on shoes. And uh, we've got a great, great lineup of speakers, and I think it's going to be um, a lot of fun for those who are inclined, not only with shoes, but with textiles in general. Well, we'll include a link to the Portsmouth Athenaeum in your exhibit in the show notes page for this episode. But is there any other place that you would like people to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? Well, um, my uh, my Facebook page is if you like a daily a daily dose of of fashion and textile history. Um, there's another place to reach me, and I'm on Twitter, and and I love hearing from people. So. Well, great. Thank you so much for opening the world of material culture up for us today, Kimberly. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and I look forward to talking to you again real soon, Les. Who knew that John Hancock had his suits altered? I just assumed that as a wealthy merchant, he would have purchased new suits as fashions changed. But perhaps that's a 21st century consumer in me talking. I learned a lot from Kimberly. I've heard the term material culture bandied about by historians, journalists, and museum professionals, but thanks to Kimberly, we now have a clear idea of what material culture is, any man-made object. And now, our trips to the museum won't ever be the same. I don't know about you, but I can already see myself spending an inordinate amount of time in front of one exhibit case trying to look at the artifact inside and see what it can tell me that is not on the placard next to it. You can find information about Kimberly, her shoe exhibit, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode. You'll find it all at benfranklinsworld.com slash 024. If you could adopt any piece of 18th century clothing into your wardrobe, what would it be? Please send your answers to Liz at benfranklinsworld.com or tweet them to at Liz Covart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today. <laughs>